police car was parked in front of our house when my brother and I were walking home from school. As we got closer, the door opened and an RCMP officer and a nurse brought our mother out in a straitjacket. They put her in the car, closed the door, and drove away. We never saw her for a year. It wasn't the first time. In 1946, a beautiful brown-eyed brunette boarded a train in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and headed to Vancouver. Then she got on a steamship and came to Powell River to help her sister look after two young children. One night, she was invited to a dance, and the guy who took her started to drink a lot when they got to the dance. Pretty soon, a very handsome, blue-eyed man came along and asked her to dance. They hit it off. He said, can I walk you home? She said, no, I'll go home with the guy who brought me, but I'll be here next week by myself. Three months later, they were engaged. Five months later, they were married. And 11 months later, they had a baby girl. I came home from the hospital, but my mother didn't. She was institutionalized for the first year of my life with what then they called a nervous breakdown, then was called manic depression. Nowadays, it's called bipolar. I went to live with my aunt, my dad's sister next door. She already had five kids, aged five to 15. My mom did come home, and two younger brothers joined the family. My dad was a mill worker. He worked shift work. I never knew when I came home from school if my mom was going to be there. My dad had a series of housekeepers that helped look after us. And I think if I'd take, taken a different path in life, people would have been sympathetic. They would have said, oh, too bad about the family. Think of, look at the mom. There's a sickness in that family. I decided that it was up to me to determine what kind of a life I had and what kind of a person I was going to be. When I was 14 years old, I was walking with two girlfriends up Alberni Street and a blonde haired a blonde, curly-haired guy in a 1955 metallic green Chevy stopped and asked if we'd like a ride. So we all jumped into the car, and he drove us up to the Plaza Shopping Center. My two friends jumped out, but I decided to stay. We drove around for a while, and then he took me home. He asked if I'd like to go to the drive-in that night. They had drive-ins then. And I said, yes, I'd like to go to the drive-in. That night, when we were watching the show, and he kissed me for the first time, I knew I was going to marry him. We spent a lot of time together the next year. And you know what happens when people spend a lot of time together, especially in the 60s. I got pregnant on my 16th birthday. What a birthday present. As I told my son, if that particular egg hadn't met that particular sperm on that particular night, we wouldn't have you. Two years later, a second son joined our family. Now those cousins that I, le that I lived with with during the first year of my life, they said to me, oh, Joyce, it's so sad. You're so smart, and you're so good in school. I thought, I'll show them. Power River School Board instituted a night school program for the first time, and I was one of its first students. 
So we scraped together the money so that I could go to school. Then the school board decided we'd offer courses with, so that people didn't have to pay for them. I took four every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. My husband came home from work, we had dinner, and I went off to school. The next day, I would sit at the kitchen table doing my homework. My toddler sat beside me doing his homework, and his baby brother was in the buggy beside us. They didn't offer algebra as part of the night school program. And the only way I could get that course, which I needed, was to go to summer school with all the students who didn't get a good enough mark. So, five hours a day, five days a week, for five weeks, I went to summer school and got my algebra. My brother played rep hockey, and they weren't very happy with the coverage they were getting from the local newspaper. So he told his teammates, my sister's really good in English. She'll write up our games. So every week, I wrote up their games, and I surreptitiously dropped it in the mail slot at the newspaper office. And lo and behold, it appeared in the paper. The next season, my brother said, well, we get lots of publicity now, but the regular house league teams don't. So I think that you should write up their games. I agreed, but I said, I think I should go and talk to the editor and make sure it was okay with him. So I went in to see the editor and I told him my idea and he said, fine. He agreed to pay me 25 cents an inch for my hockey beat column. One day when I brought the column in, he called me into his office and said, would you be interested in being our women's editor? That's what they called it back then. And, and I, said, I said, yes, of course, but you have to know that I have two small children and they're my priority. So that's fine, I became the women's editor. And when the sports editor went on vacation, I did his job because I decided I was going to learn everything I could including darkroom, processing film, <coughs> developing pictures, because I wanted to be very valuable and not very easy to get rid of. <laughs> so when the sports editor left, I became the sports editor and the union shop steward, which he also did. One day, the telephone rang on my desk. I picked it up and said, hello, newsroom, and at the other end, a very well-known uh, sportscaster from Vancouver said, I'd like to speak to the sports editor, please. And I said, you are. There was a long pause on the other end of the phone. It appears that female sports editors were a rarity. And nowadays, they're in the dressing room at the Super Bowl games. During my first set of union negotiations, I sat across from the owner of the newspaper, and quite cheekily, I guess, said, someday I want to run your paper for you. 10 years and several sets of union negotiations later, I became the assistant publisher and then the publisher of the newspaper. Now, as publisher of the newspaper in Powell River, you don't get to drive a half an hour and have coffee with another publisher and talk about publisher stuff. Uh, we were part of the BC and Yukon Community Newspaper Association, and I started to go to that association. I met a publisher there from Salt Spring Island, and three times he said, please, will you come and run my paper for me on Salt Spring? And I said, no, twice. And the third time I said to my husband, you know, if I don't say yes this time, I may never be asked again. So we made the difficult decision to leave our hometown and I moved, we moved to Salt Spring. I call that my university of life, those six years that I spent on Salt Spring, because 
we'd never lived anywhere, anywhere else. I became the president of the BC and Yukon Community Newspaper Association in 1989 and was named one of three representatives on the national board. And I became president in 1995 of the Canadian Community Newspapers Association, which is seven regions and 800 community newspapers across Canada. And that experience gave me the opportunity to learn a lot about my country and also a lot about how difficult it is to govern with all the various needs of the regions. I'd always been interested in politics because I'd met so many politicians from premiers to prime ministers. So in 1993, I sought the liberal nomination for the federal election. That was something that, you know, I thought that I could do. Newspaper publishing and politics, they, they seem to go together. Well, my husband, who is my ultimate supporter, said, of course you're going to win the nomination, and of course you're going to win the election. So he moved back to Powell River to await my political success. I lost the nomination by 30 votes. I never got to be a liberal candidate. I did learn a lot about people, a lot about politics, and a lot about myself. What now? I'm living on Salt Spring. My husband is living in Powell River. I'm commuting every weekend to be with him. What, what am I going to do? I had job offers from Victoria, from Ontario, even the Cayman Islands. But my mother was in Pell River. She, um, after many years of dealing with her bipolar um, and not having stress of raising kids like me, uh, was able to cope with her life. My brother and his family lived here, and of course my husband lived here. And one weekend, our, our friend was visiting from Vancouver, and we talked about my future. And my husband said, my wife has always wanted to own her own newspaper. Now, I thought I had more chance of becoming the Prime Minister of Canada than owning my own newspaper. But he said, well, you really should um, talk to someone that, that I work for. This was a company that owned several newspapers in the Lower Mainland. Um, it was a person that I knew, so I talked, I talked to them. And the reality of having my own newspaper was becoming clearer. We had a meeting on September 30th, 1995. My husband did an analysis of all the businesses and organizations in Powell River. He rented a, a place, renovated it. Friends came from as far away as Ontario to help us put this newspaper together. Not very many people get to work on a newspaper, volume one, issue one, the very first paper published by a paper company. We decided that we would do everything we needed to do to make it a success. I worked 16 hours a day for two years. I had a great team working with me. It, it was exciting, it was challenging, it was a lot of things. And I remember talking to a publisher friend of mine in Ontario, and he said, you know you really want something badly. When you wake up in the morning and you're so scared, you're puking in the toilet, and you get up and do it anyway. I learned, I learned a lot about through that whole process. I learned uh, a life lesson that I like to share with others. And that's when you embark upon something new, it's like standing on the edge of a diving board. Everyone feels the same. Everyone is scared. Nobody is, nobody is braver than anyone else or smarter than anyone else. And at that particular point, all it takes is one step. Some people step back, they walk off the diving board, they walk down the ladder, and they're on the ground. Other people take one step forward and they're off to a plunge of a lifetime. 
At that moment, everyone is the same. And all it takes is one step. I recommend taking the step forward. So, spring 2013, 50 years since that fateful car pickup on Alberni Street. <laughs> Next year, we'll celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary. Every day of every year, I've felt the love and support of my husband. Even when I say, I have a vision, and he says, oh no, <laughs> not another vision. <laughs> to those people who said, I bet they'll never make it, I say, you're wrong. <laughs>